with other organizers or panelists on the line. When you are ready for your attendees to hear you, press the Start Broadcast button on the GoToWebinar control panel. Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an organizer and may now speak with other organizers or panelists on the line. When you are ready for your attendees to hear you, press the Start Broadcast button on the GoToWebinar control panel. As well as the basics of grading. These webinars can be found on our website under News and Events tab. For CCA and CCSC credits, there are CCA credits for today's webinar. Let's be watching it live. Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an organizer and may now speak with other organizers or panelists on the line. When you are ready for your attendees to hear you, press the Start Broadcast button on the GoToWebinar control panel. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. I'm back on. Once verified, you can include all CCA numbers in one email. If you miss sending in CCA numbers, you can always self-report. I'm hearing a lot of background. The webinar will be recorded and posted to the SPG website for future viewing for those unable to attend or for those who want to look back at the material that was covered. Recordings will be posted to our website under the Communications tab. For today's webinar, all participants will be muted. We will be happy to take questions. To ask a question, please type it into the question box located in the GoToWebinar dashboard. You can send questions at any time, but we will hold the questions until the end of the presentation. Today's speaker is Glenda Cleasy. Glenda brings over 18 years of experience in the agriculture industry where she focused on agronomy, crop protection, and research. Many of you may know Glenda from her previous role as field biologist with DuPont Canada and DuPont Pioneer, where she was heavily involved with soybean research and field scale projects. In the fall, Glenda joined the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, and we are very pleased with the addition and her new role as agronomy specialist with a strong focus on soybeans. Glenda is a professional agrologist and holds two bachelor degrees from the University of Western Ontario as well as the University of Saskatchewan. Today, Glenda is going to share her wealth of knowledge and experience with growing soybeans in Saskatchewan. I will now turn the presentation over to Glenda. Thank you, Thank you Sheridan. So today, so today we're going to talk through uh, some soybean agronomy with a focus on soybean agronomy in Saskatchewan. If we just, if we just take a look at the soybean acres in Canada, we have seen significant growth since 2000. More than doubled. And a large uh, reason for this increase is uh, expansion in Western Canada, and in particular up to this time, Manitoba. So this dark blue line here, if you can see the mouse on the screen, is showing the, the rapid increase in seeded acres in Manitoba of soybean. And what's been happening in Saskatchewan over the last couple of years is we've been staying relatively flat. If you do look at the projected acres, this red dot is what's projected for 2017 for Saskatchewan. So we are looking at a potential significant increase in soybean acres in Saskatchewan for this season. Part of the reason might be uh, just what's happened in yields over the last year. And so yield increases, particularly in Manitoba, have been going up. In Manitoba, they've been going up on a, by an average of about 1.4 bushels per acre per year. And we certainly saw a significant improvement in the average yield in Saskatchewan in 2016, where we were averaging uh, between 30 and 35 bushels per acre uh, throughout the province and that bodes well for people considering soybeans in 2017. Just to take a quick look at where those soybeans were grown in 2016, this is a map from Saskatchewan Crop Insurance, and the darker areas are showing higher uh, number of acres where soybeans were grown in the province. 
But what is interesting to note is that there is color in almost all of the crop districts across Saskatchewan. So there was soybeans growing pretty much across the province in 2016. One thing to be aware of is the crop insurance soybean zones. So this map is showing you those uh, soybean zones. So the yellow area is soybean zone one and the purple area is soybean zone two. So the areas that do have crop insurance coverage. One of the things that I just wanted to mention is that we would like to be able to expand some of the crop insurance um, coverage areas. And one of the ways that we can do that is, is with help of producers or agronomists by sharing their yields or contacting crop insurance to have them come and see their soybean fields. So if you know a producer or you are a producer who would be willing to have crop insurance look at their field or share their yield information with crop insurance, uh, that would be much appreciated and valuable to helping to expand crop insurance coverage in Saskatchewan. So why are people choosing soybeans? There's several reasons. Certainly good standability is one of them. There's less lodging, which makes them easier to harvest. Uh, they also like moisture. They're deep rooted. They can reach moisture and nutrients. And that's, um, we've had moisture in the province. So that's been a crop that does like moisture and has been an opportunity or choice for growers in higher moisture areas. As well, uh, soybean is a non-host for Ophanomyces. So where Ophanomyces has been confirmed in fields where lentil and pea may be susceptible, soybean gives those producers an option for a, um, a nitrogen fixing crop to use in rotation where they may want to um, change out of lentil or pea to avoid a phanomyces for a couple of years. As well, there's weed control options available. A later maturity can help spread out harvest where necessary. For now, because it's a relatively new crop in Saskatchewan, there is limited disease and insect pressure. So for producers, that means potentially less trips across the field with sprayer. Um, still scouting is required, but potential less input cost. Harvestability is good. It's been uh, a very easy crop to harvest. And because it's a global commodity, there are good marketing options available. And the opportunity to sell soybeans has been improving across across the West and in particular in Saskatchewan. One of the biggest issues that producers have had or concerns with uh, growing soybeans in Saskatchewan is to make, sh make sure that they reach maturity and that they're getting the yield that's required to maximize their economic returns. What we are seeing right now is a lot of new varieties uh, that are available in Saskatchewan, a lot of new varieties in development with shorter season, shorter season maturity, and choosing the right variety is one way to help um, maximize your yield and reach maturity for your area. Some of the other things to look at, again, to maximize yields or help reach maturity in a, in a timely manner is to make sure you're double inoculating to ensure that you get adequate nodulation, fertilizing, um, to the potential that you are able to to maximize your yield. It can also help maximize plot height, plant growth, and um, help reduce disease pressure if you have a vigorous, healthy plant. Using ideal seeding rates, controlling weeds, particularly in a timely manner, and at harvest, cutting low and slowing down to reduce harvest losses. So we're going to go through these items in a little bit more detail. So first of all, selecting the right mature, uh, variety. So choosing the right variety is really one of the most important steps in producing a successful soybean crop. These soybean varieties can have a geographical range where they perform to their maximum yield potential and mature prior to frost. So understanding what varieties yield well and reach maturity in your area is really important. Uh, once you've got a maturity group, so in Saskatchewan, we would consider triple zero maturity groups or double zero maturity groups with good potential, good yield potential to be what you would want to be looking at depending on your area. Once you've got uh, some varieties in mind that are suitable for your region, the next thing you want to consider is if there's any disease resistance traits. So soybeans will have um, some rating for their susceptibility to things like white mold. They can have phytophthora uh, resistance and they can have um, 
susceptibility ratings for IDP or iron, iron deficiency chlorosis in soybeans. The other thing um, that you can consider is that the herbicide trait, so about 98% of the soybean acres in Western Canada are herbicide tolerant soybeans, um, but we do have a couple of different traits now with glyphosate tolerant as well as extend soybeans. So knowing what weeds you have in the field may help you uh, make a decision on what type of herbicide trait you're looking for in your soybean as well. So we go back to the maturity groups and selecting the right variety. Certainly, I encourage you to speak with people in your area who have been growing soybeans, especially if they've been growing them successfully, agronomists in your region, uh, at your retail where they're selling beans, and find out what people have been successful with. Another place you can go and look is the soybean, um, the SAS seed guide, which shows the results of the soybean variety trials across Saskatchewan and Manitoba. So what I just want to point out here is that the lower the number, the earlier maturing uh, the variety is for the maturity grouping. So a triple zero will be earlier maturing than a double zero. Then you see this number after the decimal point. So in the same way, Something like a 001, which is a little smaller than a 004, will again be earlier maturing than the 004. So that's one way you can look at the maturity groupings to look at what a variety might be potential for your area. If you are using this chart, the other thing you can look at is the days to maturity. So uh, during the trials, the, the varieties are measured on their days to maturity and they're ranked here to show you what's been a little bit earlier or later. We uh, had a webinar last month with Dr. Jeff Shano and he talked quite a bit about fertility. So I am gonna to touch just a little bit on fertility here because fertility is very important in pulse crops and soybean crops. So what I've got on the screen here is really what is an ideal fertility of a soybean field. So if you're selecting a field to put soybeans in, sort of in the lower range of nitrogen, but medium to high for phosphorus and potassium are gonna be important. Why? Because the maximum seed place rate of phosphorus is less than the removal rate. We'll show that next. And also low in um, salinity and carbonates. So soybeans remove a fair amount of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium uh, from the field. So they remove about 3.8 pounds of nitrogen per bushel of production. And a lot of that is going to come from the nitrogen fixation if you are successful at getting good nodulation of your crop. In terms of phosphorus, they're removing about 0.85 pounds per bushel and potassium about 1.4 pounds per bushel. This next slide just shows a comparison to other soy, uh, pulse crops with soybean and also to other crops that you might have in your rotation, such as canola or wheat. So also shown here is sulfur. So you can see that soybean and the other pulse crops do require um, sulfur as well. So just a little bit of an idea, if you were looking at removing 0.85 pounds per bushel and you wanted to get 33 bushels, which was about our average last year, you'd be looking at about 28 pounds of phosphorus and the maximum seed place rate is 20 pounds. Um, per acre actual, so you really need to be considering how you're getting that phosphorus in. We want to be looking at replacing what's removed um, and making sure we have adequate phosphorus uh, and fertility present to maximize yield. Really low soils, um, so less than 15 pounds per acre of nitrogen, have the potential to benefit from a little bit of starter end. But like other pulse crops, if you have too high of nitrogen in the field, you do have the potential of reducing the amount of nodulation and therefore nitrogen fixation that's going to take place in the field that year. Probably uh, one of the biggest concerns is that critical phosphorus level uh, for soybean growth. And if we look at this map, about 82% of the field tests were, were showing in Saskatchewan that they were below the critical phosphorus level for soybean. So I want to just bring that up because it's really important to recognize and manage the amount of phosphorus that we're getting down for our pulse and soybean crops. So make sure you have soil testing. This is some work that was uh, done by Jeff Shano and really what it's showing is that in soil placement of your phosphorus is the best way for the soybeans to take up the fertility. So you, um, a broadcast was really no different 
than the control. So that's one opportunity is to really get that phosphorus in the soil. Um, other options are applying it in years prior, perhaps if you have cereal the year before and you want to get some extra phosphorus down so it's present in the soil prior to your soybeans. There have been some studies done that have been showing that soybeans not highly responsive to fertilizer applied in the year that you are um, planting soybeans. And in Saskatchewan, we've had a couple of mixed reviews there. So in some, some smaller plot studies, they have found that. And then in some other cases, such as this one from Jeff Shano, you know, they did see a bit of a response compared to the control with that phosphorus application. The other factor that we talked about that's really important in terms of fertility is nitrogen. And as mentioned, these nodules um, can fix up to from 50 to 80% of the nitrogen that the soybean needs. So what's really important, that means is making sure that you are getting good nodulation. The actual amount of nodulation you're going to get is going to depend on uh, did you do a good job of inoculating uh, the crop as well as environmental conditions, uh, soil available, nitrogen, and uh, your whole fertility package. So in conditions where your soil may be waterlogged um, or compacted and you don't have good oxygen because these bacteria do need oxygen, you may also inhibit your nodulation. Again, starter N, important possibly if you're very low in nitrogen, but 50 to 80 percent of the nitrogen can come from good fixation. So here's just a little graph to show most of the nitrogen that is fixed is going into the grain and some into the straw. And in the case of soybeans, more is going into the straw than, in, than you see in a pulse crop like pea or lentil. And, uh, you know, soybeans have among the highest nitrogen demand for, uh, of all these crops, and that's often due to the high concentration of protein that's found in soybean seed. So what do you need to do to make sure you have good nod um, nodulation? You need to make sure you're inoculating. So soybean requires inoculation with uh, Brady rhizobium japonicum, and that is a different uh, inoculant than you would use in your other pulse crops. So if you're using an inoculant, one, you really want to make sure that you're using the right inoculant and that it's uh, this Brady rhizobium and specific for soybeans. When you will start to see nodules form is around the V2 or V3 stage of your soybean, which is really the second or third trifoliate. And we'll look at staging in a little bit. So that's why you do want to make sure you have a little bit of nitrogen in the soil because uh, that's not really, the fixation doesn't really begin until then. And you need to have a little bit of nitrogen available for those plants to get out the ground. It's often said that you, uh, you know, there's a little bit of variable uh, discussion around is there an actual number of nodules per plant you need, but um, kind of a general recommendation is that if you're checking after the second or third, tri third fourth trifoliate, that you're looking for at least about five nodules per, per plant um, to see if you have good nodulation in your field. The other thing you might hear a lot is uh, to double inoculate your soybeans, and then there's questions around what that really means. And it has been suggested to double inoculate for around the first five to six cycles of soybeans. And what that really means is that you're getting um, often an inoculant on in the form of a seed treatment and then an in inoculant that can be in the form of peat, liquid, or granular. Uh, what also people are finding is that they need to consider the rate of their in inoculant. So if you're looking at, for example, a granular inoculant that you are putting down at minimum the recommended rate and some producers have been finding that they've also had improved success at, inoc at inoculation um, by going in about one and a half times so sort of in that eight pounds uh, per acre range of granular inoculant. And what you can see in this bottom picture is where there was a plugged run of granular inoculant so you uh, definitely see the uh, impact that not having that inoculant in the ground is going to have on those soybean plants. If we look at uh, when we move on to seeding, um, some tips for seeding your soybeans. 
One is that you want to make sure you're planting it into warm soils with minimum residue. And by having a smooth level trash free field, it can help increase the hypocotyl length and the height of the lowest pods of your soybeans. As well, why you want this warm soil is because um, of the amount of moisture, so you, of the temperature of the moisture. So you really want fields with adequate moisture, but also warm moisture. When uh, soybeans are first put into the soil and they first start to take up moisture, they can imbibe up to about 50% of their weight in water. And um, if the water that they first take up in about that first 24 hours is cold, it can uh, affect the survivability of that seed. So we really wanna make sure that the water that is imbibed by that seed is warm. And what is recommended there is around the 10 degrees Celsius range. So uh, you consider seeding when the forecast is showing a warming trend and try to avoid a cold rain or snow, uh, snowfall risk shortly after seeding. It's also been shown that earlier seeding can help uh, maximize yield. So you do wanna tr consider seeding as early as possible, but it's more critical to make sure that the soil conditions are right. So typically you're looking kind of in the range from mid to end of May when those conditions might be right. Um, sort of in that May 10th to May 25th range is kind of what's recommended. But again, it's based on soil and environmental conditions at the time of seeding, which is more important. Um, also because the cotyledon is above ground in soybeans, it can be sensitive to frost. So you wanna make sure that you are not seeding too early where you're uh, risking frost damage. Another tip is to avoid fields with residual herbicide use. So we'll look at herbicides in a little bit, but soybeans uh, like other pulse crops are sensitive to some residual herbicides. So make sure you know what was in your fields the year prior and that you're making smart rotational decisions that way. Planting your soybeans, you want to plant them about one to one and a half inches deep. Seeding deeper than two inches or into soil that crusts over can result in poor emergence. And you also wanna make sure that they're deep enough that they're not going to be in soil that's gonna dry out and again, reduce uh, germination. Optimally, or your economic final plant stand today has been calculated in around four plants per square foot or around 150 to 160,000 plants per acre. So that's your optimum economic final plant stand. So we will look at seeding rates again in a little bit, but remember that's what you want to have for your final survivability. Um, so you are gonna wanna seed at a little higher rate than that um, to account for other variables. We mentioned fertility previously. So again, consider placing fertilizer away from the seed because soybeans are susceptible to um, damage from the salt of seed placed fertilizer. And roll your fields either after planting prior to emergence or wait until the first trifoliate so that you don't damage the soybean seedlings. And rolling is gonna be important if you are trying to cut low just like other pulse crops and you wanna prep your fields. Control your weeds early. So there is a critical weed-free period for soybeans, and we'll talk about that, but really it's early. Um, soybeans are not a competitive crop, so uh, early weed control is gonna be important. As well, uniform stands, and uh, stands can be impacted by biotic factors. So those are gonna include things like disease or insect feeding. So one of the things you can think about to maximize um, protection on those seeds is seed treatments as an option to help reduce stand loss from those factors. And then you've got abiotic factors, which can include things like soil crusting, soil residue, soil type, um, seed to soil contact, cold water imbibition, uh, and factors like that that are not easily controlled. And you may need to adjust seeding rates to accommodate for these factors. Um, that could impact your seed survivability. So when you're thinking um, about these factors, think that soils with a high clay content are more likely to crust and restrict soybean emergence, or low-lying areas may, re may remain wet or cool in the spring, favoring disease. 
Um, tillage and residue can impact germination uh, by keeping soil colder or create less than ideal seed placement and reduce seed soil contact, which can all reduce the soybean stand. If you're seeding with a planter or drill, you do want to consider the seeding rates that you choose, um, partly because of mechanical seed damage and um, better placement with a uh, planter versus a drill. A planting date um, is going to be important in terms of temperature and frost and earlier planting into cold soils and possibly wetter soils can definitely uh, delay an impact overall emergence. And then you want to consider your disease risk and what's been on that field in the past and what might be present so that you can adjust your seeding rate again accordingly. So we mentioned before, but there was some studies done that showed that the highest uh, yield in Manitoba in some other studies was achieved at 160,000 established plants per acre. But you do want to take into consideration some economics of seed and other factors. So that leads to the recommendation of that 150 to 160,000 um, established plants per acre as the recommendation. When you're looking at comparing a planter versus a drill, um, Again, both are, can be successful at, at seeding soybeans. Narrow rows have been shown to yield as good or better than wide rows. So the advantage with the planter is really more that you're getting um, better placement and, poten and less potential mechanical damage, which is why you have the potential to reduce your um, starting seeding rates by using a planter versus a drill. So if we look at that, uh, your estimated planting rates a uh, study that was done in Manitoba looked at the average seed survival uh, from on-farm trials and they found that seed survival with an air drill was at about 74% versus that with a planter which was about 82%. Which brings us to if you really want to target that 160,000 plants per acre um, established, then you're looking at seeding with about 210 to 220 um, seeds per acre with an air drill or around 190 to 200 seeds per acre with a planter. And again, seeding rates may need to be adjusted based on the economics of your farm, your seed cost, and um, the production that you're aiming for. One of the questions that often comes up is, where should I put, uh, where do soybeans fit in my crop rotation? So this is a chart that came from uh, Manitoba Crop Insurance. And if we look under soybean, it shows you um, the relative yield response based on the stubble on the side. So typically soybeans do very well on a cereal stubble, although in Manitoba um, canola stubble is, is not uncommon. And here you can see this based on just data from 2008 to 2012 is still showing uh, success on canola stubble. What we'll be missing here is there's no, no significant data for field pea. Um, also, lentil is not in this chart. So there have been questions coming from producers where they're wondering about um, growing soybean on a stubble such as lentil. And so one of the things that should be taken into consideration, same if you're going on canola, is your risk of disease of something like sclerotinia or white mold. Um, and both of those crops, all of those crops can be hosts to sclerotinia, so that's one of the things you want to take into consideration. But uh, certainly cereal stubble is a great, also a great spot for soybean. And if you look at the impact soybean has on crops following it, um, again, your cereals do well. Canola is pretty close, flax, so it, it is a good crop um, prior to other crops in your rotation as well. A little bit of look around soybean development stages. Uh, soybeans have a little bit different nomenclature than a, some of the other crops that we may be used to. So uh, they start with a V stage, which is for a vegetative stage. And as soon as they start to flower, they move to an R stage, which is its reproductive stage. And these stages are going to be important uh, to understand as you look at uh, applying things like herbicides and fungicides to really make sure you're maximizing the stage of application of those products and you're not injuring or causing damage to your crop or risking uh, yield loss. 
So if we look at them in a little more detail, um, sort of VE is your emergence and VC is your unifoliate stage. So your first leaf that comes out is gonna be a single leaf. And then V3 um, and the moving up V1, V2, V3 is what your trifoliates. So as soon as you hit one, it's your first trifoliate, uh, two is your second trifoliate, three is your third trifoliate and so on. So after your first single leaves come out, your next uh, leaves are gonna come out as trifoliates. And it does say on here that it is this uh, right from emergence up to your third trifoliate. That's the time you really wanna be targeting weed control and soybean. If you move on to the R stages, so R1 or R2 is when your crop is first beginning to flower. So your first flower is at R1 or reproductive one. R3, your plant is now starting to form pods. R4, it does have pod development. And R5, you're now starting to see seed development within those pods. We move on to some of the more maturity stages. You get to R6, you're now getting a full seed within your pod. And uh, as you move on to R7 and R8, you're reaching maturity and these are your stages where you're now safe from frost. So if we look at that weed control, uh, early weed control is important. It can help with soil warming for soybeans. It can help with your crop emergence. Um, if you've got small weeds that you're targeting, you can have um, good herbicide efficacy. So those are all things to think about um, when it comes to early weed control. Also, as mentioned earlier, soybean is very not competitive with weeds in the crop in, in the field. So similar to lentil, flax, and soybean will chart up crop competitiveness. So things you want to think about are what weeds do you want to control? What are your options? What about weed resistance? What's in your field? What um, modes of action or herbicide groups can you be using? And can you be doing some sort of a layering? So going in as a pre-seed um, or pre-emerge uh, opportunity and then coming in later uh, post-emerge and what about volunteer canola? So volunteer glyphosate tolerant canola has been one of the number one weeds found in soybean crops. Here's a look at that critical weed free period where we really want to make sure that your soybean crop is staying weed free. So right from emergence up to these three trifoliates and this is the stage where you want to really give your crop a good chance to get started. Remember we talked about the importance of nodulation and how much nitrogen your crop needs and that this is the stage that those nodules are developing. So keeping your crop weed free and stress free in this stage is gonna be really important. One study, this is based in Ontario, but did show um, significant yield loss due to weed pressure in soybeans. So um, you can face a lot of yield loss if you are not uh, controlling weeds particularly early on. Again, some important weeds to consider. So this is a soybean field uh, with volunteer canola, and this is courtesy of Dennis Lang in Manitoba, but this is not an uncommon site. So in terms of broadleaf weeds, volunteer canola is uh, one of the number one weeds in soybeans. Uh, and then there's a list of some of the other number one or important weeds in soybeans in Saskatchewan, as well as potentially important grass weeds. So if you're thinking about what herbicides to choose, make sure you understand what's in your field uh, and what you need to target those weeds. I uh, just highlighted these ones because they both have the potential to have resistance to glyphosate. So if you're going with uh, you know, a glyphosate alone in your field and you've got volunteer glyphosate tolerant canola or glyphosate resistant kochia, uh, you, know, you really want to look at adding something else in to control those weeds. So what are some of the potential options that you can consider? Here's a look at some of the pre-seed or pre-emergent products that are in the marketplace today for soybeans. So you can see there's, there is a good number of products that you can choose from. Uh, a lot of them are group 14 products, but there are some others as well. So take that into consideration into your herbicide rotations. And then you have additional products that you can use in crop. And then a bunch of these are gonna be um, you know, group six is your Bazagran or your Bazagran and your Viper. You do have some group two products and then again, some group 14 products. As well, you can use uh, grass control products 
and which fall into the group one category in COP. And a lot of these products can be mixed uh, with your herbicide trait products, so make sure you're following label directions and that you know what trait is in your uh, soybeans that you've chosen, the variety that you're planting. So glyphosate tolerant or Roundup Ready 2 soybeans are going to be tolerant uh, to Roundup or glyphosate, and then your Extend system is going to be tolerant to dicamba as well as glyphosate. So it does give you the opportunity to use uh, dicamba prior to seeding or in crop with these Extend soybeans. There is one Liberty Link um, variety currently in Western Canada, so uh, time will tell if we see more of those in the West. One thing, just a little bit of a heads up, is if you're using 2,4-D pre-seeds, there is a seven, it's 2,4-D ester only, and there is a seven-day waiting period, but there is the potential to see a little bit of symptomology such as this on your soybeans. Uh, they do tend to outgrow it, but be aware of that. As well, soybeans, like other pulse crops, can be sensitive to broadleaf chemistry. So products like clopyrrolid or Lontrell or metsulfuron or Ally can um, have significant impact if you're growing soybeans in rotation following application of those uh, products the year prior. And there's a little asterisk here on the dicamba because if you're growing extend beans, um, they are tolerant to the dicamba. But if you do not have that extend trait, here's some symptomology of some drift of dicamba onto soybeans. So make sure you're aware of what is in the variety that you're growing. Uh, just another bit of information around the impact of volunteer canola. So some work of, with um, Dr. Rob Golden at the University of Manitoba was looking at the threshold where you really need to take action before, you know, or else volunteer canola is going to impact your yield. And these pictures are just to help illustrate, but it's really in this area here where if you have more canola than what you volunteer canola than what you see here, you are starting to impact your yield. So it doesn't look as, you know, as heavy as these ones down at the bottom, but it is really important to get in there and to control uh, the volunteer canola early. In addition to herbicides, you can consider things like mechanical weed control as another option. Um, some work also with Dr. Rob Golden in the University of Manitoba has shown that tillage can help uh, stimulate canola emergence. So fall tillage, if you have time in the fall, could cause uh, germination in the fall, resulting in winter kill and reduced plants in the spring. Or an early spring tillage could help, um, again, help that canola to seed to germinate so that it is up at the time that you're doing your early herbicide applications. And that way, the herbicide can be effective on as many plants uh, emerged as possible. In terms of disease management, some things that you can do uh, when you're planting your soybeans is make sure you're using high quality seed. Consider using a seed treatment, particularly if you're going into um, wet or cold, so colder soils. Use good management practices. Basically, you're trying to create as healthy a plant, as vigorous a plant as possible, so good weed control, good fertility, and continue to scout your fields regularly to monitor them for disease. One of the, uh, like other pulse crops, soybeans are susceptible to uh, seedling or blights or root rot. And so um, things like Pythium, Rhizoctonia, and Fusarium we've seen in our other pulse crops and we use a seed treatment to help manage those. The, the disease that's new here is Phytophthora, and so Phytophthora is favored by wet soils, warm wet soils, but one of the things that you can be looking at as you're doing your variety selection is that there is some genetic resistance. And what's gonna be important to understand um, how that genetic resistance is going to impact your decisions on variety selection is knowing what races are present in your soil. So Manitoba did release some information recently about where they had a survey and they were able to identify some of their Phytophthora races and they did find that race four was the most predominant race in Manitoba. Uh, we will be looking uh, 
we are investigating undertaking some surveys um, as well for Saskatchewan in the future so we can have a better understanding of the impact of Phytophthora and what races we have in Saskatchewan. And another disease, again, uh, not really common in Saskatchewan at this point, but has been observed is iron deficiency chlorosis. So this is a nutrient deficiency that can limit yields and it tends to uh, show up in poorly drained or compacted soils um, or areas where there's uh, salinity or carbonates in high levels. And what symptomology you see for iron deficiency chlorosis is some of this intervenal uh, chlorosis on the leaves. So uh, if you look at some variety selection, they do have a scale showing their variety tolerance to iron deficiency chlorosis. And that is an important management step if you are in an area that is susceptible to iron deficiency chlorosis. A few foliar leaf diseases we see in Saskatchewan, um, primarily bacterial blight or septoria brown spot. Um, these, in 2016, bacterial blight was very common uh, across the province. But what we are finding right now is that these foliar leaf diseases are very rarely yield limiting. So unless they get very severe, uh, an application of a fungicide is not gonna provide economic uh, return at this point in time. What also was noticed in 2016 in Saskatchewan is some stem diseases, primarily white mold or sclerotinia. And sclerotinia was quite common across uh, Saskatchewan in, in many crops in 2016, and soybean was one of them. So what you will see is um, some of this white fuzz growing at the bottom of the canopy. You will find these sclerotia bodies in the stem. And in soybeans, uh, you can often pick it out in the field by lodged patches. And when you get there, you do see these symptoms of sclerotinia. So if you're scouting one of the things, or you're going on a field that has a history of sclerotinia and environmental conditions are uh, making it a high risk for sclerotinia development again, there are uh, products available on the marketplace for uh, control or suppression of white mold in soybean. These are taken from the Saskatchewan Guide to Crop Protection. So certainly check the label. There's different staging depending on the products you've chosen, but typical to like what you do in canola, you know, if you look at early flower, that's when um, several of these are going to be, you're going to be wanting to be proactive and getting a protected fungicide on them. A little bit around insects. In Saskatchewan, we don't have a really heavy uh, soybean insect pressure at this time. So at the time of emergence, uh, some of our common pests include things like cutworms or wireworms. Uh, so that seed treatment uh, can help you out if you're at a, in a risk for a cutworm or wireworm. Some of the other potential insect pests, uh, things like grasshoppers or uh, caterpillars that may feed on some foliage. Again, a not really high potential impact in Saskatchewan at this point in time. But it will be important to scout and as we see more soybean fields in Saskatchewan, we may start to see more insect pests becoming predominant or becoming a risk to soybean yields. So that just leads us to soybean yields. So the factors that are important to your yields are the number of pods you have to plant, the number of seeds you have in your pod, your seed size, and your plant population. If you want to go out and start estimating your yield and see how you did, the best timing is going to be once you start to see um, some of the seeds in the pod, so you can act accurately count um, how many seeds per pod you have. And the more areas you check in your field, the more accurate your estimate is likely to be. There is an app that Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers have that you can punch in some of those numbers and for both seeding as well as harvest and help you with some estimations. The average pods per plant, tend to estimate around 10 to 14, the average pods per node about one to three. And what is important to note here is that uh, you need to manage your harvest losses because there are about four soybeans per square foot can equal about a bushel per acre harvest loss. So at harvest, a uh, majority of soybeans are gonna be straight cut and you can begin around 16% moisture or less. What you want to watch is if they get too dry, so under 12% moisture, they do become more susceptible to damage. Uh, consider a flex header for harvest to reduce harvest losses, uh, slow down, cut low, slow the cylinder. Harvest losses tend to be highest at uh, the header, 
And for storage, you really want to be looking at sort of that 13 to 14 percent moisture and then more around 11 to 12 for longer term storage. And again, the drier they get, particularly around this 11 to 12 range, make sure you're handling soybeans gently as they can be susceptible to cracking or damage. So thank you very much, guys. I wish you a very safe and successful season and look forward to uh, all the soybean acres that we are potentially going to see in Saskatchewan in 2017. Thank you, Glenda. Um, thank you all who attended here for joining our second webinar in the 2017 Pulse series. We are going to open it up for questions here in just a moment, but while you're getting your heads around some questions and getting them typed in, I am going to repeat just a bit of information that may have been missed this morning with our technical difficulties at the start of the webinar, and that was regarding the CCA and CCSC credits. There are credits available, and in order to get your CCA credit for today's webinar, you must be watching it live. For those who attended the webinar, Andrea will send out an email after the webinar requesting your CCA number. If more than one person is watching from your computer, you will need someone to verify those in attendance. And once verified, you can include all the CCA numbers in one email. If you miss sending in your CCA number, you can always self-report. And the webinars are recorded and will be posted to our website. So that's the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers website for future viewing for those that are unable to attend or for those of you that just like to go back and relook at some of the material. This is also a great opportunity for you to provide some suggestions for future webinar topics. So when Andrea sends out an email at the end, uh, you can respond with some suggestions as well as feedback on the webinar that was presented. So thanks, Glenda, for speaking. At this moment, we will open it up to questions, and I do have a couple questions. The first one is, what is the residual nitrogen benefit with soya beans for next year's crop? Okay, thanks, Sherilyn. Um, we did talk about how much of the uh, nitrogen that is produced for uh, by nodulation in soybeans and that a lot of it is in the grain and actually uh, a lot of it is uh, taken up and used by the, 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 the stem as well. I'll just see if I can go back to that slide. So um, there is the potential to have some, uh, like other pulse crops, to have some nitrogen um, carry over for the following crop. But, um, you know, as this grain and straw is removed from the field, or at least the grain, you are removing a fair amount of that nitrogen. Uh, so you uh, have less available then for the following crop. But like other pulse crops, uh, there are um, benefits from having the nitrogen fixing crop in there. So it will help the following crop take up more of the fertility in, in the field. Uh, we don't really have a, a great handle on a number uh, at this point in time that I'm aware of for soybeans in Saskatchewan uh, for the following year, but some of the work that Jeff Shano's done has shown that it does tend to fall into a range similar to other pulse crops. P does tend to be the highest from the data that I've seen from him, but um, soybean is likely to be somewhat uh, on the lower end similar to other pulse crops. Thank you. Another question that has come in um, related to kind of fertility. What happens if you forget to put your inoculant down or have a problem at seeding time, or you just don't have good nodulation in the field when you start checking? Can you put down extra nitrogen to compensate? And if so, how much and how should it be applied? You can. Um put down extra nitrogen. So depending on uh, the stage of your crop, what you want to do. Uh, some of the numbers that I've seen have shown that you can put on uh, up to about 44 or 45 um, pounds of nitrogen foliarly, but you, um, you know, you might want to consider where, what stage the crop is at and how you're applying that. So is it, can you dribble band it so you're not really getting it right onto the foliage? If you just want to top up, you could consider other products um, that might give you a little bit of top up, things like an alpine type product or something along those lines.
but if you're applying right to the tissue, you do risk uh, susceptibility if you go too high. So make sure whatever product you choose that you're, you're following label recommendations and label rates. The next one is um, you had mentioned that it isn't uncommon for Manitoba producers to seed soybean on canola stubble. Have they found any negative effects of canola stubble on biological nitrogen fixation in soybeans? I am not aware uh, of that. It's something that we could certainly look into. Um, in the studies that I, I have seen where they've evaluated it, uh, they've seen, they have seen the occasional location where there's been a decrease in yield with soybeans following and then they have had other locations where it's been um, less impacted. So based on that, um, you know, it, it seems to be more affected by um, phosphorus impact uh, than it does nitrogen fixation. I have a question from Alberta, and it sounds like they can't get any more granular inoculant there for soybeans. Can they double inoculate with liquid? Um, what do you recommend? Yeah, I mean, any inoculant certainly is going to be better than, than no inoculant. Some of the work out of the University of Saskatchewan has shown, uh, you know, it, under the right conditions, not significant differences between the formulations. A lot more of it is going to be related to the stability. Um, if you do talk to growers, some of them have found the granular for them to be more effective. But certainly, um, you know, there's not a problem with using a liquid inoculant as long as you're making sure you treat it properly and you've got good viability of the of the inoculant. Do you recommend increasing the rates then to mimic double inoculation? <laughs> Um, I mean, you want to get on as much as you can. There's certainly going to be an economic threshold. Um, so you want, to, you want to do what rate is needed to get the right amount of, or the equivalent amount of, of, of bacteria and rhizobia in, in the furrow. Okay. The last question I have at the moment is changing gears and relating more to harvest. And do soybeans need to be desiccated? Typically, soybeans are not desiccated. They do tend to stand well and dry well. They drop their leaves. So there's uh, really not a lot of need for a true desiccation in a soybean. Uh, where you may want to consider a harvest product might be if you have a very weedy field and you're wanting to burn, uh, you know, get some control of some of those weeds prior to harvest to make harvest management a lot easier. Okay. I think that's the last of the questions that have, oh, we have one more. How sensitive are soybeans to early fall frost? Um, it depends a little bit on the severity of the frost and the stage of the crop at the time. So, um, what I have seen is if you've got a good canopy and you get a light frost, you will see, you can see symptomology in the upper leaves of the canopy from the frost where they've, you know, where they've, they've caused injury or death to those upper leaves, but the pods underneath the canopy have been protected and have been safe. If you get a frost early enough that is going to impact the pods and the seed, and they're still green, basically what's gonna happen is um, those seeds are gonna dry down, uh, shrivel, and the green is gonna stay um, in that seed. If your plant is far enough along in terms of maturity, uh, you're not going to see a significant impact on yield. So as long if your seeds are, you know, they're formed, they're drying down, the, the impact of that frost is gonna be very minimal on yield. Well, thank you, Glenda, for speaking today um, to us on the agronomy of soybeans. As well, thank you to Andrea for organizing the session today, as well as a big thank you to all of you who participated and joined us today and provided questions as well. 
Just a reminder, mark your calendars for our next webinar, which will take place at noon on June 12th, and it will be covering scouting for diseases and pulses. You can sign up for this webinar from the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers website under the New and Events tab. Other than that, I think this has concluded our webinar for today. Have a great day, and thank you once again.